How are you today? Excited, some. How are you, Anna? Yeah, she's right. Awesome. And before we get started today, uh, myself and Mary wanted to have a chat with you about the children issue again, actually. Um, because we've made some decisions about it that uh, are probably going to trigger many of you, so we're going to talk to you about them. What we're going to do, we feel the children issue isn't being addressed still by the parents uh, and also perhaps by the rest of the audience too. So what we've decided to do is we want to stop any children from going downstairs near the processing rooms at all or so upstairs or in the kitchen areas. Uh, yesterday there were quite a few children traversing through all three of those areas and what we want to do is stop that happening at all. Now. Many of the, your parents uh, don't keep a track of what's going on with your children. And so what we want to do is show you, we're going to give everyone a chance to act in harmony with love here by the, doing an experiment over the next month. And the experiment's going to be this. What we'll do is every time we notice a child um, going into one of those areas, we'll be bringing the child up to the back uh, door up there and I'm actually going to stop my discussion and I'm going to ask whose child that is and ask the person who's the parent to go up the back and have a chat with the person who's brought the child in. Now what we don't want is for you to focus on the child's behaviour because the child's behaviour is a complete reflection of your own unhealed emotion as a parent. What we're going to do instead is focus you on the emotion you feel as a parent about what's happening with your child. Now, now if the behaviour doesn't stop after a period of two more seminar weekends, so we'll give it a month and if it doesn't stop and we still f feel the same things happening, myself and Mary have decided that we're no longer going to use the venue. Right. So that will mean we don't have a venue and um, we might just uh, hold groups at Wilkesdale. <laughs> Um, the reason why is that uh, we feel that it would be very beneficial for many of the parents to re-look at the parenting DVDs that we did. Now very few of the parents were actually at that presentation and so what we'd like to encourage you to do is to, if you can get a copy of those DVDs, have a look at those DVDs and look at your own emotions that would drive your children's actions. So right at the moment there's children right in the back there and many of your parents don't even know whether it's your child, where your child is, what's going on. Many of you have also been bringing your children along knowing they're going to be bored. And you need to look at why you're doing that. Like why would you purposefully bring your child to something that your child is bored to actually be present at? And what's going on there for yourself? And for many of us parents, and this is emotions that, uh, there's some of the emotions that I'd like to address, for many of us as parents we have this feeling that we almost regret becoming a parent. And we regret the time and energy and resources that it takes up inside of us about becoming a parent and having to do this and know what our child is doing and so forth. Not understanding actually that our child is just a perfect reflection of the emotional condition of its environment. So the children at the moment are perfectly reflecting our emotional condition in whatever they're doing. So one, yesterday during the discussion, uh, f quite a few children came in up the back and were quite loud. They were loud enough for me to be a, a little distracted and I know yesterday I wasn't in fine form, but yesterday I, was, I could feel the children and their, and their distraction. Now that is the audience wanting to be distracted. Does that make sense? That's the audience's law of attraction. And we need to start looking at the fact that the children are actually perfectly reflecting our law of attraction. N not just the parents, but also as an audience, our law of attraction. And our feelings about the venue. And this is why if, if we can't deal with this issue emotionally, myself and Mary don't feel comfortable using the venue anymore. Because if we can't actually apply the teachings of love that we're receiving in a way that's owning the emotion, then I just feel like, well, I might as well go home with Mary and enjoy ourselves at, uh, at Wilkesdale and uh, you won't see us very much <laughs> during that time. And it's not a threat, by the way. It's actually a, just a feeling that I have that it's pointless 
talking about things over and over again without there being action on the issue. Does that make sense? So, so I'll address your questions in a minute, Nina, and I know you have quite a number, but um, <laughs> the, the issue is, like, firstly, I know with the children you need to consider why is it that they feel bored? Now, they feel bored because like, I know that I like having, listening to a guy talk for four hours is a very boring thing, right, for most children. But they're also feeling bored because of the lack of interest of their parents in them during this process. Does that make sense? There's also something going on there with regard to love and acceptance and approval and all these other types of emotions. So it's very important for us as parents to start addressing the issue. Now, I know every new group there's new parents with new children at a group and that's fine the the same principles will apply in every case in that if we find that this issue of love of the venue is not being addressed and appreciation and gratitude for the venue is not being addressed then it's something that we as an entire audience need to look at and i am not willing to hold seminars in a venue that's not being appreciated um, by a group of people who are present. Does that make sense to everyone? Now I know that's quite confronting, but we're here to learn about love, but not just to learn about love, but to actually practice love in our lives, which means actually practicing love for everything in our surroundings, including our own children. And I feel it's just so important to understand how much of what's going on with our children is our own law of attraction. So some of you parents will feel embarrassed about this kind of events happening. Some of you might feel angry with your children and that's covering over some grief and sadness that you feel about the whole thing that's going on. And we need to address these issues rather than just talk about them anymore. I want to demonstrate to you that I'm serious about addressing these issues whether you are or not. Right? And I'm perfectly happy to not have any more seminars here if, if, it, if one or two of you get to the stage where you understand what's going on with the law of attraction with regard to the children that are present. We don't want to get into the stage of stopping the children from coming because all they are is a reflection of the parent's own law of attraction. Does that make sense? You wanted to say? I was just going to say that it is an issue of us practicing love as well. Every time we come here, we're receiving a gift uh, from Peter and Anna of this space for us to invite all of you and give you a gift. And um, if we feel that that gift is not being respected, then uh, we have a, a, a loving obligation to consider whether we want to keep receiving that gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just to um, talk about some of the logistics in bare bones, just for all kids from now on, there will be no downstairs in any of the rooms, no upstairs and no in the kitchen at any time. Uh, and also that from now on, if we can use the... <laughs> can't be too close. If we can use the rear door for long. all of us, <laughs> for all of us to come in and out rather than the side doors and for us at the moment, we're going to keep the, all the side doors shut just because there's an issue that um, they're managing here at the centre with the carpet and, and things like that. So we just need to keep it shut. And also that um, often a lot of you get quite cool um, or hot in the audience and um, people uh, sometimes adjust the air conditioning or ask me to adjust it. From now on, we're just going to have it set at this temperature all of the time um, because AJ um, often gets quite hot even when we're quite cold and so just if people can bring a jumper or, or a wrap or something like that um, to regulate the temperature because often it's our emotions that are making us uh, regulate in temperature. So what we'll I find is I talk about something that makes most of the audience afraid. The majority of you go into cold and then straight away it's too cold in here. And then I talk about something that makes you angry and the majority of audience goes into anger and goes into hot and then it's too hot in here and then and there's this cycle going on. And then, of course, this is happening with all the spirits that are present as well. So you've got this, like, cycles going on all the time. It's far also, we've got the issue where there is mould that has been growing in the hall itself due to the amount of moisture that's been around recently and Anna's been trying to remove that. Um, so obviously we need to keep it closed to stop 
extra. And you notice there's these dehumidifiers all around the place at the moment, just trying to suck out the water in the atmosphere inside to get rid of some of the uh, mould. But, but that's more of a physical issue. The, the, for me, the issue with, with the parents and the children is to, is, is to really look at what's going on for you, being present when your children don't want to be, and, and also look at what's going on emotionally when they are here. And also, uh, I don't understand why none of you have maybe organised some kind of... Um, roster, roster to check on the kids? Or like for some reason, there seems to be this projection that somehow we should do that when we're already... You know, the, the, the owners of the venue are already pri giving the gift of the venue. We're already giving the gift of our entire time for the weekend. And, and everything that we've got for the weekend. And, and yet there's this sort of expectation that, um, that we also somehow organise something else for the children as well, right? Which, which is just an expectation. So what we want to do is, uh, is ask you as parents, why don't you get together and sort out what is actually happening in terms of keeping your children interested if you want to bring them along? And, and what's, yeah. what's going on there for you? Why, why, do, why don't you want to take responsibility for that? Does, does that make sense? Like look at that issue emotionally. The reason that we haven't even suggested that until now is because we feel that that is um, a part of you being parents and taking responsibility is, is thinking about what's happening in the venue and, and what you could do to uh, make it safe and amenable for your kids as well as for everyone else who comes along because there is an issue of respect of everyone else who's here wanting to listen to AJ. Um, and so if your kids are being distracting or noisy, um, there's an issue in there for you uh, about not only uh, yourself and your kids but everyone else who wants to hear. Mm. When Mary and myself have a child, um, what will be happening is uh, I hope to actually have the child um, with me while I'm giving talks um, and whatever the child does will be my law of attraction, like in terms of... Uh, <laughs> If it starts screaming while I'm talking to you, well, obviously I'll have to deal with that firstly because that's my love of the child would need to be expressed in that way. And, and so we feel quite strongly that it's really important to start addressing the issues as parents with regard to our children and what kind of things are happening with our children. And if you haven't seen the DVDs on the parenting, which are very confronting DVDs for the majority of people who ever see them, um, my suggestion is to have a look at them and, uh, and let yourself work through some of the emotions that cause you to distance yourself from your children so that you don't know what's really going on. So basically what we're going to do is trial that for a month and in a way it's a bit sad that we have to do even that because it means Mary and some others uh, volunteering to actually keep an eye on what's going on with the children and then and bringing the children in the back to point it out to the parents when really the parents should already know what's going on with the children and already know where the children are and so forth and what's really happening. So it's a little sad that we've got to do that and that's why we don't want to do it for a very long time. But we want to give you an opportunity to, to actually work the issues through in a loving manner. And if that opportunity uh, doesn't work, then uh, our next step will be in one month's time, so, so there'll, be, there'll be two more weekends like this and in one month's time we'll actually stop doing groups here at the, at the, sem at the centre and, uh, and probably still do some workshops upstairs until they're all finished um, and then we may not use the centre at all. It just depends on what happens after that. And of course it's not, nothing, none of these decisions are permanent but it's just a matter of having a look at what's going on from a law of attraction perspective. So what am I feeling inside of myself? So when the children, even up the back, are, uh, we're here up the back and they're, and they're being quite noisy and whatever and interfering with your listening, what's going on for you emotionally? Have a look at that. Because that, that is a whole audience law of attraction. So let yourself feel about that. So you know that smidge of annoyance that goes off inside of you about it and what's their parent doing and all those kind of feelings that come up in you? Allow yourself to address some of those things. It's a bit like when somebody's mobile phone goes off Many of you have a projection at that person. Well, that was all of your law of attraction. Does that make sense? We need to... And I, I think I've left my mobile phone on, actually. So, <laughs> um, But do you know what I mean? That, that all needs to be addressed uh, in some way, uh, emotionally. Um, was there anything else that was... Oh, 
just um, also another issue around love. Um, uh, there are a core bunch of people who volunteer to clean up and set up this venue every single time we're here. So they mop the floors and vacuum and clean every toilet and wash every dish and stack them up and put them out again uh, every time. And um, they're basically the same people every time. And just for people to have a look at um, where they're at around service to other people and mm. gratitude and, uh, yeah... I feel it's, it's up to you if you want to be in service or, or give in that way, but... Um, but to look at the reasons why... There's why you don't feel compelled to just help out. Um, even just grab a broom, you know, not to take on a significant role every time, but... And the beauty um, of it, the more people who help, obviously, the faster the job gets done. And also, the same people don't have to do it over and over and over again, and then they get tired of it, and then, you know, you don't have that attrition process that goes on. So... So just feel about if, if you haven't been one who's ever offered assistance but you've been here frequently, ask, ask yourself what's going on inside of me that I can feel that I could just come, use the facilities and services and just go without me wanting to participate in, in showing love to others. Does that make sense to everyone? Just uh, uh, ask yourself that question inside of yourself. Ready? That's it. Oh, that's right, Nina wanted to ask a question, so we'll give her a mic. I'm just wondering what a loving way is to ensure that the new parents and new children come actually understand the requirements of the venue, because some people might come and sit up the back quietly and stuff like that, or we're just going to assume that they find out through the kids and the other parents and stuff like that. I think that the kids who come all the time, they, they know the rules or, you know, they know and they're learning about love from their parents. So I think they can be leaders in that. But there is someone, Natalie, are you here today, Natalie? No. She's, who sometimes greets people as they come and I was going to talk to her about just um, mentioning that when people have kids with them. Uh, just, just the basic ground rules anyway, the no downstairs, upstairs and kitchen thing, yeah. The feeling we have, though, is that when a whole group of people have a certain feeling towards the venue, then everybody who comes to visit will also feel that feeling in the group of people towards the venue. Does that make sense? It's an automatic thing that goes on. And if the children have the feeling, because the parents do, because your children's feelings towards the venue are actually a direct reflection of your feelings towards the venue. And so if the parents have a feeling towards the venue of gratitude and love and care and, and, and all of those feelings towards the venue, then the child is also going to have that feeling towards the venue. And so instead of all the children being misled by one person and doing something damaging to the venue, there'll be more of a positive influence in the other direction by all the children who are, who are present frequently. So th the, key, the key is to deal with the attitudes that are there inside of ourselves emotionally. So, so one of the big attitudes that many of us have, and I've mentioned before, is this attitude that, oh, you know, People who have money should provide things for us, you know, like we deserve them and they, they've got the money anyway and you know, who cares if, it, you know, there's a bit of damage here and there, they've got the money to fix it anyway. And there's a lot of those kind of emotions that we have which actually are born out of anger towards people who have more than us oftentimes, which comes from causal emotion in our childhood as well. And so oftentimes we've got all these causal emotions that motivate um, our own attitude and we don't see our own attitude. So, for example, one of the attitudes we have is, I'm allowed to demonstrate my own free will no matter what I choose to do. Now, that actually, while it's, while it's true in one sense, you're forgetting one other part of that, and that is there is a consequence for every unloving thing you choose to do. So while, from God's perspective, you are totally able to go out and murder if that's what you wish to do, Right? God's not going to step in this all of a sudden and stop you from doing it. Right? This is why there are murders happening on the planet, because people want to do it. And God doesn't st step in every time and grab the person by the scruff of the neck and pull them up and go, hang on a sec, you're out of line now. You know? like, that's not how God acts towards us. Right? God allows it to happen. But there is a consequence in that person's soul for every single act that's unloving. And when we argue for free will without arguing also about the consequence. In other words, internally, whenever we say to ourselves, but I've got free will, I'm allowed to do what I want, 
why aren't our children allowed to do what I want and so, what we want and so forth? What we're arguing for is free will without consequence. You see, and that's straight away out of harmony with divine love principles because all free will has consequences. That is a part of the law. So, so what we need to do is address, address inside of ourselves as parents. All right, what rebellious spirit exists within me that makes me feel that I would like to have free will without consequence? You know, there, there's often a lot of emotions in that. Remember I've said to you as a group many times that the biggest single emotion that you will ever have to deal with on this planet that's been the most damaging emotion on the planet is the issue of self-reliance. Right? And almost all of this argument about free will without consequence is about wanting to be self-reliant rather than God-reliant. Right? Wanting to be our own boss, in other words. You know, have total control over my own life. The irony is the only time I'm going to have total control over my own life is when I'm in a space of total love with everything around me. That's the only time. The beauty of the way God designed her universe is that without me being in a space of harmony with love, I am also going to have a set of consequences that create my own unhappiness. That's the beauty of the universe. And when we start to appreciate that, we start to appreciate how much love dictates. And that's why it, um, I said in the first century, and also it's stated in the Bible before I even arrived on earth, that actually love is the fulfilment of the law because when you love you don't need a rule the problem that we've got in the venue at the moment is because we're having to create a rule because love isn't being displayed so us having to create a rule of downstairs no children kitchen no children upstairs no children is actually a consequence is actually a consequence having to create a rule is actually not is actually there because there is this aspect of love not being displayed inside of us as a group and and we need to look at that what's going on with that inside of us does that make sense to everyone and when i allow myself to actually focus on the fact that oh i have this emotion and i have that emotion i have this emotion all related to the venue and all related to good things and you know pretty things and so forth and and people with money and lots of other different emotions that will all be, all be surrounding this issue, when I allow myself to work through that, now I can have just total gratitude for the venue, total gratitude for the people who have provided it for us, and also a total respect that they're allowed to make as many rules as they wish in the way in which this venue is handled because they're giving us that gift on those terms. Does that make sense? So they're giving us a gift already like if we had to pay for this venue, like the donations wouldn't cover for it. So, so we wouldn't even be able to meet here without that donation. Does that make sense of the venue itself? And what we're doing is by, by not treating it well is we're disrespecting that gift. And one thing we need to learn about God's gift of love to humanity is that when humanity disrespects the gift of love, that's when all the troubles arise. That's, what, that's how everything began in the first place. That's how we got into the mess that, that we are on the earth in the first place, have on the earth in the first place, is that we have disrespected the gift of love that God gave to humanity. And we still do that every day, like we eat and eat, and that's disrespecting the gift of love to, to animals, you know? Can we see we, we do these things constantly and we need to stop doing them and that's part of respecting what love is about. Now, I can even intellectually get myself into the space where I at least acknowledge what love is about before I can feel it from the heart. So I can start acting harmonious with what I've learnt already before I feel it just by, just by no acknowledging, well, okay, I know that when I slit an a, a, a animal's throat, the animal doesn't feel very good. Like the animal feels pain, for example. Right? The animal feels fear and so forth. And when I slit its throat, these are the feelings that it has. Do I, you know, intellectually, even though I don't have any emotion about it at this point, intellectually I can go, obviously something's wrong here for me if I keep slitting this animal's throat or keep getting someone else to slit their throat for me. 
Does that make sense? There's something wrong inside of me emotionally. All right, I know it's there, so let's write it down. I know it's there. The issue is I've got an issue you know, with regard to not respecting the gift of life with regard to animals, perhaps. Now, that's the emotion. Now, I know I haven't dealt with the emotion at that point, but I can at least start acting in harmony with what I know to be truth, can't I, at that point, and work my way through the emotion concurrently. And what many of us ha have a tendency of doing is saying, oh, well, I don't feel that yet, so I'm not going to do what I know to be right yet. And that's not acting harmonious with love either, and that's a consequence <laughs> to that as well. <laughs> you know, every time we do that, you can say there's a consequence to that. Mm, sorry. Am I just... My Mary and myself at home now are just saying each other's words all the time. And anyway, it's just getting a bit, it's getting a bit weird sometimes, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to join us for the rest of the conversation, or are you? Yeah, I can. You don't have to. No, one, two. Uh, no. I, I'm happy to. Hey. I just feel you're saying the same thing so well. Uh, <laughs> I should enjoy a different face, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, has anybody got any other questions about those subjects? All right, Barb, there's a mic behind you. As a, um, a parent but a non-parent with children here though, mm -hmm. and, and there's more of us than the ones with parents, mm -hmm. what have we, with children, what have we done wrong for this to occur though too? We've obviously well, have, rather I've, than look often at thought, I've often thought when you've talked about this, I've actually switched off. I've said, well, my child's not here, so it's not a problem for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. But that's wrong. Yeah, that, that, that's incorrect. Uh, um, obviously, children reflect their environment. So you know, if their grandma is in their environment with their mother, then there is a mixture of environments that affect the child. And the child reflects both of the emotions in its interactions with those particular people. So children are perfect reflectors of all unhealed emotion. So that includes all unhealed emotion of every single person present. And the way you feel it is, do you have a feeling, right? Do you have a feeling inside of you when the child did something? So whatever that feeling is, is the part of the issue. So if a child comes in the back, it's a bit noisy out the back, what was your feeling? If your feeling was, oh, that's a bit annoying, there's your issue, there's your law of attraction being exposed in that moment. Does that make sense? Secondly, not, don't look at what's to blame, because uh, we're not trying to blame anything here. All of us have unhealed emotion which we need to, at some point, address. The key is to look at it as an opportunity to address these unhealed emotions and, so, and also an opportunity to display love more fully in, in our lives, personally. And so the more and more of us that can do that, the greater the effect is going to be on our children, but also the greater effect is going to be automatically on our environment. The fact is our animals and our children are the most powerful effects on us. Emotion, uh, on, on, uh, reflections of our emotions. And just recently we had a letter from somebody and she sent this whole letter about her emotional state and wanting some help in her emotional state and everything. And we got to the bottom of the letter and she told herself in the bottom of the letter her exact issue without knowing it. And and the situation was the lady felt that she, um, she had a... Um and we'll reply to her letter, she might hear this, but she had a health issue and um, she felt she'd identified the emotion that was causing the health issue and she was processing it and she felt she was processing it and, but it didn't seem to shift the health issue. And then in the PS of the letter she said, um, my dog actually gets really worried when I'm going into this grief. So can you see what the issue is there? She's projecting, she's not feeling the causal grief, she's actually projecting in that moment that somebody help me with this, somebody share with me in this and any time we're doing that in our processing, we're not getting to the causal because the causal you can go to on your own um, and you'll, you'll be on your own when you feel it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so her, her dog was actually telling her the answer and the answer was that she wasn't actually feeling her causal emotion, she was projecting outwards the, un, the, the need for somebody else to feel commiseration and feelings for her and the dog just perfectly reflected that projection straight back at her by coming up and getting distressed at her own distress. Right? The truth is when you own an emotion within yourself completely, your dog will not get distressed, nor will your cat, nor will your child. Right? That's the beauty of emotional processing. When you own your own emotions fully, 
now everything, everyone around you does not feel the projection of those emotions anymore. So quite often what we find is that many people come up and ask questions and many with children come up and ask questions that their children are actually reflecting at them right at the moment the answer, right? And, and we're not e examining it and looking at it. So my suggestion is have a look at that uh, parenting, the Parenting Weekend DVDs and allow yourself to work through some of the emotions associated with that. There's a very good PDF on the internet as well that you can download, so it's a written note form of the whole talk that covers a lot of the stuff that even we didn't cover on the day, if yeah. I remember. Yeah, so they're all available to you. Okay? Many of you now feel like you're being told off. Um, no. Can you feel why that is? I, um, it's not being told off. Well, I personally feel not being told off. I'm feeling maybe a bit ashamed that I um, reflected to the children yeah. uh, my annoyance instead of reflecting love to them. Yeah. Because that yeah. has created more annoyance by that. Yeah, and, yeah. and the fact that you have the annoyance feeling going toward them, it's an anger feeling really going towards the child. The anger is covering your own grief of some, about something here, about you not being loved, you not being respected or something going on there under, uh, under the layer of anger. So the anger, the, the other projection is really just the damaging projection and the underlying stuff is what we need to get to and we need to own. So, so many of you I can feel when the ch children do come up the back and run around a bit or whatever, there's this instant projection at the children but in reality what we say, oh okay, here I am projecting at the child, obviously I'm out of harmony with love now, let's go deeper into this, what is it about? Oh I feel annoyed, they're interfering with my enjoyment of this experience or whatever it is that you're feeling annoyed about and the irony is, is as, as collectively as we deal with that emotion or those group, different emotions, the children will all calm down and do the, reflect those. So we all have to take responsibility for what happened, has exactly. happened, not just the parents. Exactly, yes. And it's very important to understand that is that it's not just the parents that are involved here but it's also the, all, of, all, of, all of us as an audience. Because obviously many of us have been parents in the past done quite a bit of damage to our children in the past, haven't really understood the mechanism by which that damage occurred and still haven't healed the emotion that created the damage in the first place with our children. And so many of these opportunities where we have beautiful children coming along to the venue is an opportunity for us to actually start looking at some of those emotions too. So look at everything as, one of the, as an opportunity to, to deal with those things. Yeah. yeah. No worries. And Lily? It's me. Um, I just wanted to suggest again um, a five minute pause before we go to the tables if we could. It just gives us a chance to not have to struggle to put things on the table. Thank you. Did everyone get what Lorleen was referring to just when it's time for a break? We mentioned it actually not that long ago um, that when people come out, everyone's hungry, but if you can just leave five minutes for the ladies in the kitchen to put out all the stuff on the table um, before mobbing it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Because there's some pretty good stuff, isn't there, Sol? Like, I'm going to miss out. I missed out and I'm going to miss out. Yeah. 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 Good call. Uh, I agree. <laughs> well, it's not me. So it's something else. Well, I like our proximity. I'd like to even be closer for this. <laughs> see, we're just... I'll stand even closer and see. Yeah, no, something... It's one of those mics. I've got to sort it out. Right. Someone at the back. Has has yeah. Thanks, Nina. Hey, Jay, just regarding that issue you were talking about, about children, mm -hmm. um, it's a very organic audience. It changes all the time, so you're going to get new people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, how how will, we, will you address that? Will you be reiterating it 
Well, like I said, if, if the majority of the people here have a certain emotion coming from them of care and gratitude for the audience itself, uh, for, the, for the venue itself, then obviously that's going to rub off on everyone else. But, but if the majority of people here haven't healed those emotions of gratitude and care and, you know, wanting to act lovingly in a manner towards others, can you just turn that one off too and just see what's going on? Um, then if the majority of audience don't, don't um, um, feel that, then, then obviously any new person coming along is not going to feel that either. So, so while I don't want to have to keep talking about these issues, what we're going to do is act. So remember I said to you quite a few months ago now that I was not going to keep addressing issues of unloving behaviour all the time by talking. I was just going to start acting harmonious with what love should be in each case and what's harmonious with the truth. And so many of you may feel a bit triggered with that as it comes up, um, but, but it's going to be the most powerful thing if you can allow yourself to go through that particular process. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, do you want to be wired? No. There's nothing to attach to there, is there? <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> Very so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, get on to the subject. Um, which was this subject? The human soul and passionately desiring positive, positive change. How did you feel about the discussion yesterday so far? Exciting. Yeah. Can you see how, if you can see how you've got actually a lot more control over your own progression than perhaps you've realised. You see, a lot of times what we do is we wait for our law of attraction to bring us a negative event, and then the negative event triggers us, and we get all upset about the fact that we had another negative event triggered us. You know, and why do we keep having a negative event? So we go through all that emotion, and then then we go through the emotion that the negative event actually triggered, which was. A whole different emotion generally and we feel about that one and then we dread the next time it happens and then of course because we dread the next time it happens there's fear in there or whatever of course it happens again and away we go again on the same cycle can you see actually that it's sort of almost a trebling of your emotional work when you do that whereas if you go for the passionate desire for positively changing and setting up your life in such a way that your life is actually now attracting all the things you need to trigger you emotionally, whatever those things are, and you, at, you start working with your soul. You see, at the soul level, your soul automatically knows, this, through the laws and what's being confronted within it, it automatically knows how to actually deal with all of this emotional baggage. The problem that we have most of the time is we, we want to avoid it. So that, that's the issue that we face. And I think that change happened for me when I, I think, and I think maybe you're going to talk about this, um, when my faith in the process grew, like when I realised, oh, wow, well, I worked through that emotion and it did really change my whole law of attraction. Mm. Until then, I think even though intellectually we might trust the theory that, yet yeah, if I deal with my emotions, my law of attraction will change and I'll get closer to God, um, if we're not passionately desiring it, I think it belies the fact that we haven't actually shifted into that place of really believing it emotionally mm. and having faith in it. Mm. Yeah. Is it too? Yeah. So, so can you see how um, there's quite a few emotions that actually we well, quite a few qualities, I suppose you'd call them, that we really need if we're going to get into this place of having a pa having a passionate desire to change rather than resisting the change all the time. And, and one of the primary emotions is the ones that Mary just mentioned, faith. So, so let's just write that down. So what do we need faith in? Well, can you see how firstly we need faith that change is good? Because most of the time, what do we believe really? That any change is going to be bad for me. So, so when I'm faced with living in truth with my partner, for example, so let's say, let's say I've cheated on Mary and I'm faced with this aspect, all right, I want to grow towards God, so I'm going to have to actually deal with this aspect that I've cheated on Mary. So I actually get into this place now where I'm willing to speak the truth to Mary about what I've done. So that's one of the things that are going to be necessary. So I begin to speak the truth to Mary about what I've done and... Uh, and 
and I start realizing that actually if I tell her the whole truth, it's going to sound really bad. Right? Um, and if I just say, oh, I was attracted to somebody, right? Uh, sorry about that, you know. <laughs> and we <laughs> and <laughs> Mary then has a cry for a few days about, you know, that her hubby's been attracted to somebody and and uh, and, and she feels bad about it. And I go, whew, you know, well, you know, if that's what it was like, two days of crying with me just saying I was attracted to somebody, what about the time I slept with them? I, that's going to go down really well, isn't it? So, so what I do then is I don't have any faith that me staying in a place of truth and actually positively acting in this situation is actually going to cause any positive change. What I do instead is I'm standing and go, Dread, well, what's she going to She cried for two days with me just saying I was attracted to somebody. What, what's she going to feel when I tell her I kissed her as well? And then what she you going to feel if I tell her that actually I, I didn't just kiss her, actually we had sex um, once as well. And then uh, it wasn't just once actually now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, it was last five years, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and you just imagine, you imagine the emotions that are going to come up there, right? If, and, and I'm now going through my mind, I, uh, boy, you know, and, and we get into all this justification of, oh, I don't think I can hurt her that much. I'm sorry, mate, but you're hurt her by doing it already. Right? So, you know, telling her the truth is actually, is actually going to help her a lot rather than hurt her. But we often go, oh, I don't think I could hurt her that much. I don't think I can, you know. And what are we really doing? We're afraid that telling the truth, acting in harmony with divine love and telling the truth is actually going to break our relationship that I might have decided after the affair that I actually want. Right? And I'm not willing to face the fact that actually this change that's going to happen as a result of me having some, and, and I need to have some faith that there's a change that's going to happen, that this change is actually going to be positive for us. There must be a reason why I cheated on her for five years. There must be a reason why she didn't notice it for five years. There must be something going on emotionally for tho those events to occur. Does that make sense? And now, by me staying silent, I'm not trusting and I don't have the faith that actually what I raise, harmonious with truth, is going to actually cause anything positive. I actually believe instead that she's going to have a meltdown and sure enough she has the meltdown, <laughs> which you can understand, right? And, and now she wants to leave me and then like, you know, three months, six months time, I'm still pleading with her to forgive me, but she won't forgive me. And she, eight months time, she goes off and has some other relationship because she's still upset about what's happened. And, you know, all these different things could happen. And in my mind, I'm going, oh, this ain't positive, this ain't positive. You know, I, you know, I can't open my mouth and tell the truth here. Right? And the reason why I'm not doing it is because I don't have... Faith. I don't have faith that if I do things God's way, everything will work out for the best. I just don't have that faith. Right? Can you, you want to say something about it? I know you want to say lots about this. Uh, I was going to say uh, I need to have faith that change is even possible. So some people are in the reverse situation where they've been unhappy for a really long time and they, they don't feel that it, no matter what they do, it's not going to, it's not going to change. Mm. So how many of you feel change isn't really possible dealing with your emotions, for example? Yeah, some of you feel that way? Yeah. Because a, a lot of times, you, you know, many of you have had the experience already, you deal with one emotion and you think you got it, right? You think you got the whole thing out of there. But your damn law of attraction keeps kicking you in your backside again and telling you that you didn't really get it fully, right? So you go, oh, you know. And then this law of attraction happens again, you know, like the second time you think, oh, I've dealt with that. And there's all these flavours often to our law of attraction, but we, after the third time and we still haven't dealt with the actual core issue that causes our law of attraction, what do we start doing then? We start going down this road, oh, maybe it doesn't work, you know. It's like, oh, no, no, it's like... We don't, we're starting to believe inside of ourselves that it's not possible to, to fix things inside of us. Another thing we need to have faith about
God is good and loving. Now, big issue for us, most of us, we come from some kind of religious background or some kind of background in our past, whether it be New Age religion or whether it be Christian religion or whether it be some other form of religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, usually we've had some kind of upbringing and even an atheist has some kind of upbringing, by the way. So what we finish up believing is, firstly, many of us don't even believe in a personal God. So that's an issue right at the beginning. But then we don't believe that God is actually good and loving. We actually believe in many cases that God is just as bad as any vindictive parent. In other words, what's one of our primary beliefs? One of our primary beliefs about God is God is a punishing God. Look at my life. Aren't I getting punished? That's what it feels like a lot of the times, right? So we go, God is a punishing God. Now, that's not a truth. God is actually good and loving, but I don't believe it yet inside of myself because I've got all these emotions towards my father and all these emotions towards my mother and that's driving a lot of my stuff. But in reality, the truth is that God, the God that we don't know yet properly because we're not yet at one with him, that God, that God is actually good and loving. In fact, is, is far surpasses any single individual you've ever met on this planet or in the spirit world in terms of love and goodness. And in fact, all the love and goodness in any of those people as a total comes from God. So God is even greater than the total of all the loving and goodness that you've ever seen on the planet or in the spirit world. And God is even better than that. In fact, if we go further, it then follow that God is, it must be infinitely good because there is an infinite number of <laughs> things that God has done that are all good. So, so the truth is that when we begin, we need to have faith that that is true. Because we don't believe it yet. We don't believe that's true yet. Inside of ourselves, we don't believe it's true. We hope it's true, which is totally different than believing it's true and feeling it for ourselves. And so what happens is when an emotion comes up, what do we go? We don't go, oh, God is good. He's going to help me get through this emotion. He's going to help me resolve it all. I know that if I do everything God's way, you know, I, I do it in a loving and truthful manner and I'm honest with myself and I'm open and I feel this emotion pass through me, I know that I'm going to get through this. We don't feel like that hardly at all. What we feel like instead is, no, God's a punishing God. He's punishing me again. Look at the law of attractions hammering me, hammering me. Why did God make this law of attraction thing for, <laughs> right? And, we say, and that's what we do. We, say, we get so angry and upset, right? That we, that we start getting into a rage with God about what God's done because we don't believe that actually everything God's done is good and loving. So what about this spirit influence thing? Hey, how cruel is that? That's what we start feeling. You know, when I start talking about spirits and how they can influence our life and what they hook into, why did God create a system like that? Like, not understanding that, of course, that even that system is loving. Right? We don't understand that yet because we don't have the feeling yet that that's true. But at some point, we need to have the faith that it's true. Because if you don't have the faith that it's true, and remember, if we define faith, it is being able to see something in the future that we can't feel yet. Does that make sense? So we're holding the idea of that thing? Yeah, we're yeah. Hiding, holding this idea that this is true. I, can, I sort of have this knowing inside of myself that as long as I do this, whatever it is that I've got to do or say or feel or work my way through, as long as I do that, the end result will come to me. You see, to work towards God, you need to have faith that God actually exists, that God is actually good, that God is actually loving and that all God wants is a relationship with you before you will even begin wanting a relationship in, with God. Can you see that? Like, How can you have a relationship with God when you don't believe there is a personal God and you don't believe that God is actually good and you don't believe God is actually loving and you feel that God is actually punishing if there is a personal God at all? How can you then develop a relationship with that person? going to be very very difficult right so we need to at some point have the faith that this may be true even may be true 
before we begin. Right? Now, obviously, if we don't have any faith that it may be true, we will never do it. We will never try to do it. So if you think about faith in the sense of how... So faith is a very, very scientific principle, by the way. Every single creation on this planet that has come about from technology has come about from the faith of somebody. Right? Some guy had to go, well, you know, there must be a way to actually talk in this device that you can hold to your ear and walk around the whole planet. Right? Now, if you'd said that to a person 200 years ago, they would have said, you're absolutely nutters. That's just not possible. If, that, if you'd said to a person 200 years ago that actually there can be a place way, way in another country that projects an image and that image will go through space and actually enter a device that you can watch in your own room, in your own living room, and you see everything that's happening in the world. In, in real time. In real time. Yeah, you go, uh, don't be stupid. <laughs> like, that's totally unrealistic. That, now, somebody said, didn't say, oh, don't be stupid anymore. Somebody said, oh, I think this is possible. And they had to have so much faith that it was possible that they were willing to invest a large portion of their life creating it. That's how much faith they had to have that it was possible. Right? Now, without that faith, there would be no science in reality, would there, if you think about it? Because nobody, th everybody goes, oh, you know that uh, thing called television that you know, we think might be possible, and we, let's give it a name called television. Well, everybody here says, no, no, it's not possible. And anybody in the audience who thinks it's possible, we get them up the front and we just belittle them and make them feel stupid and... You know, like, tell them how idiotic they are to believe in something that's totally impossible. So that's one way to control the whole thing, isn't it? Well, instead, what we need to have is faith that actually there are these possibilities that as long as I deal with things harmonious with love and truth, and again, that requires another whole section of faith, that everything will come about perfectly and I'll be able to actually create this thing. That's, that's what faith allows us to do. And it's so powerful. It's so powerful. AJ, could you talk about faith in... Um, I know in the past I've had um, feelings about faith being a blind thing. Faith being something that doesn't involve your uh, sense of reasoning or your sense of logic. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously now I feel faith is something very different and that there's a... Um, there's a there's a way to always test my faith, if you like, or to prove my faith. I just need to have the faith in the beginning and then I will receive a result. Mm. That's quite different to some of the faith that exists on the planet today, isn't it? Mm. Of people um, who uh, almost uh, use faith as a defence. So faith is not blind. Yeah. And faith isn't stupid. You know, a lot of times we, you, you hear people talk about... Uh, Born again Christians, for example, about the issue of um, the, work, the fruits of the spirit, you know, that they talk about, and a lot of people say, "What? Well, what's stupid? How stupid can you be to believe in that?" You know, and a lot of times that's what we believe. We we believe that faith, having faith, is stupid, and you know, it it actually comes from this underlying emotion of disillusionment of a lot of the things that we've desired in the past and we had a desire to see in the past, haven't come about in our lives, and we're unwilling to feel the grief of that. And in the process of not feeling the grief in that, we get angry. And in the process of being angry, we basically start being a cynic. We become cynical. Right? So we don't believe that anybody can have a good motive on the planet, for example. Right? We don't believe that anything that comes about is actually going to be for our benefit because we're cynical about everything. And you can see this cynicism, which is the opposite of faith. You can see cynicism growing on the, in, the in the planet, can't you? Like, and there's so much of it. Every, it pervades so many areas of our lives, this cynicism and, and un the underlying emotion of disillusionment driving it. And faith is not 
uh, like something that we can really be cynical about because it's actually a physical and spiritual and metaphysical quality that we can develop that creates. Without faith, nothing gets created. Right? Why would you ever have made a wheel? Like, you know, the wheel that we've had for thousands of years, right? Why did somebody make it? Because they obviously had some kind of faith at the beginning that if I make something that's curved, it might roll over things better. Like, you know, how hard is it to make a wheel, really? It's quite difficult, isn't it? You'd have to spend a. You imagine doing it by hand, like having to chop down the tree to get the wood having to carve the wood in or, or shape the wood in such a manner to make it into a circle and then having to fix it to an axle and so forth, all the things that need to be done to make the wheel. Like obviously there's a lot of effort there. You know, wouldn't you rather be going out and shooting, or when I say shooting, you know, spearing the, uh, spearing the piece of meat for tonight rather than starving for five weeks while you're making the wheel? And so what happens in most of the time today on the planet is we get into this state where we're only interested in anything that is a quick fix to something. This is why people are addicted to New Age philosophy, because it appears to be a quick fix. Many of you became addicted to New Age philosophy and then realised 20 years later that it wasn't as quick a fix as what you'd believed. <coughs> right? But we start the process because we believe it's a quick fix. And faith is not like that either. Faith, faith is very patient. And faith, you were saying before, faith is very creative and full of possibility. Yeah, yeah. faith is creative. So now if I apply this principle of faith to the subject that we're discussing, which is passionately desiring fo positive change, can you see that if I'm cynical about change, that it's going to be very hard for me to passionately desire it? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. But if I have a belief inside of me, if I have faith that I can change positively quite rapidly and I can experiment with some of the principles of that, then obviously now I'll have a desire, I'll passionately desire to do it. If I have this feeling inside of me of disillusionment with the universe and the world and what it's done and what it's done to me in my life, and I don't deal with that emotion and I let that emotion drive me for the rest of my life, then I'm going to, it's going to be very hard for me to passionately desire change. Can you see that? So, so I need to have some faith that actually all of these things are possible and all I need to do is exercise a desire to get them. Now, faith isn't as stupid as what many people think <laughs> because, you know, most of the time what we do is we fail to perceive what has been done before us. Now, to give you an example of that, you, you obviously know now that you can fly in an aeroplane. In fact, they've now made aeroplanes, haven't they? What's the new uh, 7, whatever it is, 9-7 or whatever, 8-7 or whatever it is? It can have 550 passengers or something in it. Right? A380, sorry, 550 passengers, double layer, two storeys high, like this great big monstrous thing flies. And it doesn't just fly, it flies at like 600 miles an hour almost, like, you know, it just flies at these incredible speeds, a thousand kilometres an hour or so. And it flies and it carries 550 passengers. Now, we all know that now, but you take us back 200 years. And if, if I said to you as an audience, actually, I've got in my mind this great idea <laughs> that we can build this machine and it's going to fly with 550 passengers in it and on top of that, it's going to propel them at 100 times the speed that a horse can walk. <laughs> right? And you'd be going, what an idiot. <laughs> like, what planet's he from? Right? 
How crazy is he? Unless you're a child, and then you Unless might Unless you're a child, you might be quite fascinated. But as an adult, our cynicism drives our response to what we hear, you see. So we're very cynical about everything we hear generally. So there I am, I've got all these wonderful ideas in this mind that I'm getting. A lot of them might be channeled, of course, from the spirit world, but, but anyway, I'm there. And now what requires, what is required of me with all of, let's say, all of you as an audience hearing me say that, go, uh, it's way, way out there, it's not possible. And you're projecting all of this stuff at me. Like, so you imagine you being in that position where you're saying something that nobody else around you even believes is possible. What's it going to require for you to actually go ahead and create it? Faith and courage, really, in the end, isn't it? So let's look from the faith perspective. Firstly, you're going to need to have a lot of faith that actually what you actually feel with inside of yourself can be carried out. Why would you otherwise invest like years and years and years of your life experimenting with making it happen without having some kind of driving force? And do you know history is full of examples where people gave up on their faith only to have someone else grab their particular idea with a bit of extra faith, another year or two of it, and all of a sudden you have a creation. There's, history is littered with people like that, right, who gave up on their faith, who stopped having faith. And so, so can you see how if I'm going to stick with the divine love path and I'm going to passionately desire positive change for the rest of my existence, I'm going to not not want to have any more this des desire to give up when the going gets tough. And it's only faith that's going to get me through that. Faith that if I continue, everything will get better at some point. Can you see that? It's only faith that helps me there. Do we have a mic across? The front? Can I um, talk about my journey with faith a little mm. bit from an emotional perspective? Um, because when I met AJ, I, um, I had been on this path of passionately desiring positive change on our planet um, and wanting to deal with lots of the injustice that existed and um, I was very much um, working with pe refugees and, um, and asylum seekers and all these kind of people. And what had happened to me is that um, I had become very, very cynical about love actually winning out. And I felt that um, you couldn't go for the real fix anymore because I'd tried and so many people had tried, not understanding, of course, the way you really fix things. Um, but I was happy to work around a lot of um, negativity in order to make things just a little bit better for people. And... Um, so what I had to go through, I was just thinking about ways that we grow in faith mm. um, because f for me, two years ago when you said you have to have faith, I go, oh, that's fairly empty. I don't know what to do with that. And I was just reflecting that what I had to do with that was gr a lot of grieving around my disillusionment and cynicism about what was happening in the world and that... From that grew my sense of what might be possible, but I couldn't just manufacture faith. I had to be real about where I was at at that time, and that involved grieving quite a bit. And I was very angry, uh, as you can attest to, mm. about the situation in the world and uh, wanting everyone to have this social conscience and mm. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I remember one of the very first interactions I had with Mary uh, soon after we got together was w we went, when we went shopping. And, uh, I'm sure that story's been told before, but when we went to buy the mint or something that was produced in Israel and um, I gave AJ a long lecture on human rights violations in Israel, <laughs> and we bought the mint in the end. <laughs> that was in England, yeah. Well, I bought the mint. I know you were still <laughs> pretty upset about it. And, uh, and it was a matter of working through, like, does this... You know, we're so used to punishment on this planet, aren't we? When somebody does something wrong, or what, what we believe is out of harmony with love, what we do is we punish them to bring them back into harmony with love. Instead of doing that, what we need to do is address the emotional issue instead. So, so let's address the emotional, Israel, uh, the emotional issue of the human rights violations in a country like Israel. 
Now, because that seems like such a big thing to try to achieve, what we do is we yep. give up on that. And I feel like such a small person and I don't believe in violence, so what can I do? I'll, I'll boycott. That's my answer. Because I've given up on healing myself around that. Yeah. yeah, and given up on anybody else healing about it. So what we do is we get, go into this punishment phase of boycotting and we don't understand it. Actually, ah, a boycott is just another expression of my rage <coughs> about my frustration that I'm not being able to change this issue. And so we go down that track. Does that make sense? Carol had, sorry, yeah, Carol. You, yep. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, I had a conversation the other day with another person about faith and mm. he mentioned that um, he gets confused that it, what he has could be hope and, um, mm -hmm. and then I always thought that I had faith with this path but then I started to question myself, maybe mine's hope. And then I started to get a little bit <laughs> down because, um, um, you know, otherwise I probably just want to throw the towel in <laughs> on this. Yeah. Sorry. Um, because that's what I've been hanging on to, what I think is faith. Don't really know what faith is, I suppose. It yeah. is a bit of hope, yeah? No, um, no, they're very, very different qualities. Okay. Yeah, actually. So, so you can hope that uh, somebody you really like might be attracted to you at some point in the future. Right? And you can hope that for 10 years. But does it ever become real? Well, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. What I'm saying is for the majority of people that might not happen. So, so why hasn't it happened? Because the faith wasn't based on anything that was real. It was just a <coughs> hope without it actually being real. So l hope can be something that's based on something totally unreal, whereas faith is always based on something that's real. The illustration of the point is that when we fully faith, have faith, whatever we have faith in always comes to fruition. It always has some result. When we have hope, Hope can often result in no result whatsoever. Right? How many of you hope that there's no war on the planet today? Right? And yet, like, there's still war on the planet today and tomorrow and the next day, but we can have faith that it's no war on the planet if we do a certain thing or if we take certain actions that can create it. And so faith always, always has action involved as well, whereas hope is often, I sit down and hope, but I don't have to do anything other than hope. And often hope is born from emotional injury. In other words, I don't want to feel my underlying emotional reason. If, it, if I didn't have hope, what would I feel? I'd feel hope less. And let's go, let's go deeper than that. What does that feel like? So, so, so to use the illustration of me, when I met AJ, I hoped that um, I was going to be able to be at one with God. Um, but really, I had all of these horrible feelings that actually we can't heal ourselves and we can't change. And I had to go through them in order to gain faith in what I needed to do to get to that point. So faith is more of an active process, whereas hope is sort of a, uh, an emotion, I guess. And, and hope is often born out of an emotion of wanting other people to do things for us. Whereas faith is that we are prepared to be involved in the process ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I have a bit of a thing about, uh, and I've been um, paying out on God a bit about it, how I'll, because I'm on this path then you help me get there yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And um, I've been doing a bit of, yeah, paying out there lately because like, I, feel like, yeah. <laughs> I feel I'm like... Yeah, I'm trying my hardest. No one else is trying. <laughs> I feel like God should be giving me a bit more into, you yeah. know, like divine intervention or whatever. Give me a bit more <laughs> yeah. of what I need. I'm on the path. <laughs> I'm on the path. Isn't that enough? You I know, need you to I'm show on... me that it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I come back to all the time law of attraction and when I'm released then that changes and it's kind of like, is that it? You know, is that all I got? So sometimes I feel a bit like that though. Yeah. A lot of times hope is actually covering over quite a bit of rage um, because it, we often uh, have quite a lot of hope about certain things happening in the future but, but what actually finishes up happening 
is that uh, we, we, we are using our hope to cover over our frustration that it's not happened in the past. So, so for example, I, you know, I might meet a woman and I hope that she takes an interest in me. Right? Now, that's totally different than taking action and having some faith that if you take some action, something will result, isn't it? So I can sit there and hope all I like, but there's a high likelihood that without any action, this woman's not even probably going to notice me. Right? And so this is the this issue we face. Often hope is born out of our desire to not act, whereas faith is always about action because faith motivates action every single time. When I really have faith, then I'll have action. Simon, I'm not going to ask you for a question because you've been projecting at me for the last 10 minutes to have the question answered. Sorry, but that's... <laughs> If you can feel about that, then we'll come to you. If you can come over here. Um, AJ, I recently had a quite a good thing happen with faith. I um, was in depression. Yep. And um, I didn't know what to do about it. With depression, I felt like I was going down. And, and it was actually realised that law of attraction started to help me, somewhere I started to have faith and I was sitting at a cafe and there was a little sign put on the table for the table card and it was a saying by Winston Churchill and it said when you're going through hell, just keep going yeah. and that it's suddenly, suddenly gave me faith. It's Mary's favourite saying. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah, I just wanted to share that that really got me going and then suddenly other law of attraction things came in yeah. and somewhere I felt the change was possible yeah. and it was possible for me to come out of it. Yep. And I came out of it quite quickly. Yeah. And things came in, you know, like I went on medication and realised that that wasn't right. And then I had a phone call from my homeopathic doctor who I'd forgotten about. Suddenly came in and she got me on some stuff and that helped me get off the medication on that. And yeah. then from there, there were other people here that helped me through it. So yeah. it was just having that faith all the way through, but just that one... Law of attraction helped me, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and can you see too how your desire also had an effect? Like Yeah, yeah. You know, while while you sit there and wallow in something, there's not much desire to actually do something for yourself, but you were prepared to actually take action for yourself as well. So that was an important part of that. And faith always does that. Faith is a is a highly motivational thing. It motivates you into action. Like so every single person who ever created anything in the in history has not only like faith wasn't something they, they sit there and they, yeah i believe that's going to happen yeah okay and then nothing happens because they didn't want to do anything right the truth is that every single person that has a real faith finishes up creating they finish up creating what they have faith in and that's what we do too yeah, yeah it's a very powerful quality yeah. come to ivana and then up the back to um, I was just wanting to know your views on like uh, things that are made in China and um, you know that sort of thing and like because pretty much if I was to go to the plaza and go into any shop really it would be you know something like that um, so yeah so ha um, and that in relation to love of the other people who are not getting paid very much for you know their time for creating these things? So the answer would be to boycott all of that. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen then? Then those people who are actually the workers would actually get nothing and, and obviously getting something is better than getting nothing. So, so what's the real issue? The real issue is our penchant, our desire, particularly in the Western world, to be, be money focused all of our life. So if I wanted to heal some emotion inside of myself about what's creating this issue, I need to first look at myself and how much I'm conscious of money, how much I'm looking at saving money all the time, how much I don't want to pay what things are really worth, how much I feel like I'm getting ripped off all the time, how much I don't want to work for the money that I get to, how much we are in this state of uh, having monetary system that is based around uh, value, how much we value people with lots of money and value less with those with none. And can you see there's lots of emotions in it? Yeah, because I have, um, well, my law of attraction for a long time, well, 
my whole life practically has been that I haven't had much money. Yeah. Um, up until last year when I was working, you know, a 40-hour week and I was like, yeah, woohoo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, my whole week was gone in a job that I didn't like. Yeah. Um, so we're willing so to yeah. compromise for money, yeah, and sell ourselves for money. Yeah, and when I do go shopping, I sort of think, mm, that's not worth blah, blah, blah amount of money. Yeah. So, yeah, that does actually make sense. I haven't actually thought of it that way to and actually think deal of it, with my that stuff. If every person on the planet did that, then we would never tolerate a person not uh, living on a subsistence wage, for example. We would, we would actually even, we would never even tolerate having to buy water. We wouldn't even tolerate having to buy food. What a ludicrous proposition, if you think about it. How crazy is it that you have to buy water? Like, almost every one of us do it, do we not? Don't you have water rates? Yeah, that you pay? What, how crazy is it that you've got to buy something that within three days, if you didn't have it, you'd probably die? Like how crazy is it that we've created a society that you've actually got to buy that instead of it being available to every single living creature and person on the planet? That, that, that's a crazy place when you think about it. We, we are living in one crazy world when you think about it, just with the aspect of having to buy water. But let's also then look at the issue of buying food. What a crazy proposition. Like I can understand it maybe having to buy something like an, a painting or something like that that somebody creates, but, but having to buy food? Every single one of us at this point needs food to survive and yet we're there, what, buying it? And, and what about the people who actually... Who actually um, Create the food. We were in uh, when we were in New Zealand. There was this. Uh, they had an abundance of uh, strawberries. You remember? Yeah, was that was on the news. I think it was in the states. I was in the states. Uh, they had an abundance. There was an abundance of, of strawberries. And what they were doing, because there was a especially good crop that year, and what they were doing was they were destroying the strawberry plants, rather than have anybody allowed to come and pick them because they were afraid of getting sued if somebody had an accident while they were picking the strawberries. Oh. So they were destroying literally thousands of beautiful, beautiful like, huge strawberries. They were just destroying whole acreages of them. Now, we say, oh, that would only happen in America. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens here. This is what we do to our own wheat crop quite frequently. When we have a bumper crop and the market rate of that crop goes down, you know what we do with it? We burn it or dump it in the sea. That's what we do with it. Right? Why, why would we even contemplate? Like, that's just craziness. And what is it all based? Because we all want to have money. We all want to have some wealth. And that's what's... So we, what we need to do is address the emotions with this. Now... Let's look at it from the perspective of faith. The positive change would be that actually what would happen is in the end we wouldn't have to pay for water, we wouldn't have to pay for food, and anybody who produces water or food is automatically given everything they need to produce it. So they don't have to go and buy a tractor, they don't have to go and buy whatever it is that, that, that we expect them now to buy. They actually get given all of those resources to produce the food. Right, because they have, and they have the desire to produce the food and they're just given the resources because the fact is that it, it's just a loving place to be if we can give this food that every single person on the planet needs and give the water that every single person on the planet needs. Now, at some point I have to have a faith inside of myself that if I deal with my emotions about money, that a lot of these things can be created. Does that make sense? But if I don't deal with my emotions about money, I'm just going to ignore them. Can you just turn off the mics one by one? Can you just turn that one off? Um, it's that one. Okay. I've got another question. So what do you guys do like when you buy clothes and when you buy food? Do you look at where it comes from and like... No, I, I look only at my emotional injuries that would create such a thing every single time. So when Mary pointed out to me that I was buying mint from Israel, right, <laughs> I have to... <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Right? 
And I have to look at my own emotions inside of me of what inside of me would create this problem. Oh, okay. Um, so what inside of me creates the problem where, where of human rights abuses, for example? What inside of me? What, what unhealed emotion do I have where I feel I can want something from somebody and actually put them down to get it? So I need to look at that emotionally. Um, do you mean you'd still go ahead and buy it or you would want it and then deal with the emotion and then see what you do after? <laughs> if I need something, I'd definitely go and get it. Okay. <laughs> However, I also look at the underlying emotional reason of what is going wrong with it every single yep. time. Right? Okay. And what inside of myself creates that? My, what fear inside of me creates it, what lack of love inside of me creates it, all of those things. And try to address that, each one of them emotionally. You see, one of the things I taught in the first century was that if you, if you attack things, you are actually going to make them worse. And this is one thing that most people on the planet still don't understand. Every time I act in a violent manner towards something, it actually makes it worse, it makes it bigger. Right? So let's, uh, my classification of violent manner, a boycott is a violent manner. Right? Yeah, that's the way I feel. If I boycott something, I'm actually going to make the situation worse. If I address the underlying causal emotion within myself, because that's the first person and usually the only person that I can first address the emotion in, then I am now not contributing to this particular problem anymore emotionally. Does that make sense? And because I'm no longer contributing emotionally, physically I won't also contribute automatically as a result. So you will find as you deal with different emotions about lack and things like that, you'll find, oh, all of a sudden I don't need as much food. Oh, all of a sudden I don't need any packaged food. Oh, all of, you know, all of a sudden I can grow most of my food and I don't need to buy much of it anymore if I didn't want to. And all of a sudden I can live just on fruit and vegetables and, and a few nuts and that's all I need anymore. I don't seem to need you know, the wheat bits in the morning and the, you know, all these different things anymore because all of the emotions that have been driving all of this stuff in the past in me have all disappeared. And all of a sudden, oh, I no longer need processed food anymore for some reason. In fact, the processed food tastes bad to me after I've dealt with a group of different emotions. It actually tastes bad for me to go and get a spaghetti. Even though it's not meat or anything like that, it still tastes bad. It, still it affects my body and it feels bloating and it feels terrible. And so, you know, sometimes when we come over to the, the coast now and we go out to dinner or something, we come home feeling like, ugh, that was pretty bad. <laughs> we just had a vegan meal <laughs> somewhere, but it still felt pretty bad because there was a lot of processing in it and, it, and it. and my body now, particularly my body, is just rebelling against that. And so after a while what happens is you start getting into this state where you don't need all these things you thought you needed before because you've dealt with the underlying emotions and so that automatically creates better things happening in the environment. So, so you know how the majority of people on the planet would have a bin three quarters full of all this manufactured stuff like being thrown, thrown out, you know, all the paper cut, you know, all these other things being thrown out because they don't know what else to do with it. After a while what happens is you finish up getting a whole bin and it might last you two months. It takes two months to fill up the bin and then after a while because you deal with different emotions and everything, now, now, now you fill up half the bin in two months right? because all of the other stuff that you're getting and all the other stuff you're attracting into in to eat and everything else is actually creating less and less and less waste automatically because you dealt with the soul condition that created it in the first place. And so, so what eventually finishes up happening so what, what's happening for, at, for us at home now, almost everything that comes into the place gets somehow recycled somewhere. And the other day I was, I, was, I, I, I love my worms, right? So my worms are like, they're honoured in our, in our place. And <laughs> they're like our babies. They're our babies, right, <laughs> at the moment. And, and the reason why I love these worms so much is because almost every single thing that is that 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 you could imagine aside from plastic and those things which we don't get much of anymore and um, every single thing that comes into our home almost goes to the worms at some point and it's amazing they produce this beautiful soil <laughs> that we can use to grow other things from cardboard like 
So at the moment, like last, last week, every single day, I'd get out my wheelbarrow, fill it, full of, fill it full of water, pack it full of cardboard so it all goes soggy, and then chuck it all on the worms. And within a few weeks, that's all gone. Right? All the worms have just eaten it all. And, and not only have they eaten all, what comes out is you pick up this soil and it's soft and light and fluffy and you can do anything with it. It's just amazing. And, and that's a part of bringing your soul condition into more and more harmony. As you bring it into more and more harmony, everything around you seems to work in such a way that there's less waste, less damage, less hurt to the environment, less hurt to people as a result. When I met AJ, I was trying to do it from the other end. You know, I wanted to be organic and recycle and, and do all of these things. Um, but I was still carrying all this other emotion and I was very confronted when AJ went, no, you've got to, we're not going to do that. You're going to, like, we're going to talk about this emotion. And, but now as it's happening for me, I, it's, it's a natural result and it's not an effort and it, it just flows a lot quicker. Mm. Yeah, everything flows better. So if you multiply that by each one of us in the audience and you multiply that by each person in Australia, you imagine all of a sudden how... Like now we've got these huge landfills getting filled up with rubbish. You imagine, like Coca-Cola would go out of business, um, <laughs> right? And and like I remember having one talk with uh, some people in the US, and they told me that if they had to not drink Coke in order to get at one with Diet God, Coke. Diet Coke, in order to be at one with God, they would they would actually never be at one with God because they love Coke that much. And I thought it's just so sad, a sad statement of the world, really. But, but yeah, look, if you look at it, how, how, what would happen to you? Firstly, what is Coke full of? It? And sorry, guys who manufacture Coke, like, <laughs> but it's full of sugar, right? And what happens to your body when you eat lots of sugar? You get lots of problems in your body. You, your body becomes very acid. All of a sudden, your body doesn't work very well. You get all these health problems occur because of sugar overdosing. And so, and eventually you have all sorts of internal organs uh, ca um, breaking down because of the... Now, if all of us decided out of a love for ourselves, we would never drink a soft drink again. Because it's just really a love of self issue. So out of love of myself, I would never drink a soft drink again. Imagine if everyone in Australia decided we're never going to drink a soft drink again. Now, firstly, all of those, you know what would increase? All of the ones who are growing oranges for orange juice, you know what's happening to them at the moment? They are letting their trees die because there is no demand. Right? They are ripping them out by the hundreds of acres in the Rivland, just letting it all die because there's no demand. Why is there no demand? Because we're all hooked on soft drink. Right? So imagine all of a sudden all the juices stuff would start reappearing as well, wouldn't it? Which is much more harmonious with the environment and also with your body. But if you start thinking about everything that's affected, all of a sudden just changing that one little thing, for, and the reason, because I love myself, all of a sudden there's these huge changes that occur. And all these positive changes can occur just by me making one choice harmonious with love of myself. Just that one choice. You imagine how less plastic bottles there would be by us all not drinking soft drink anymore. It would be huge, wouldn't it? Like, how much of that goes into landfill and everything else? And plastic, how long does it take to degrade? It's not like glass where you can just smash it up and reuse it or anything like that. It's, it stays in the landfill. You've either got to melt it down again to, to, to reprocess it, which means you've got to clean it and melt it down. Huge amounts of water resources being used to do all of that. Whereas with glass, you can smash it in, pulverise it into dust and use it in the garden. <laughs> right? So totally different. And yet what we've done is because of our demand, we create the result. So if we're looking at, all right, why is there all this landfill? And I look at the emotion inside of me. Okay, the emotion inside of me is I want a convenient thing, right? That's what I want. And I'm still addicted to convenience myself. Like I'm still working through emotional issues about being addicted to convenience. Like we have 28 one litre glass bottles at home to drink water in. And I still drink out of plastic bottles. 
Mind you, we get most of it from everyone else, but that's how it happens. But why am I doing that? Because I'm afraid of dropping the bottle <laughs> in a venue like this and having a big mess to clean up. Right? That's the only reason why I do it. It's an emotion right? of desire and convenience and so forth. An emotion that needs to be worked through at some point. Right? So can you see that in the end, if we all just started to do it, address those issues, but even just did it out of the sake of our own health, how much change there would be. So I love myself so much that I'm never going to drink a sugar drink again. Like, drink that's full of sugar again. Wow, like, you imagine what we're having in most of the shopping centres? Like, can you imagine? There's a whole aisle of them. Like, where would that, that, that that's all got to go, isn't it? Like, at some point, that'll all go. You, you see people with their shopping trolleys covered with what? 48 Coke cans or Coke bottles or whatever, you know? And it's cheaper than water. You, do you understand that? I don't understand that. <laughs> like, 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 water costs me, like, you know, one of these bottles is what? I don't know. Two, well, if you buy it at a service station or something, it's like two or three or four dollars sometimes, right? And yet I can get the same thing in Coke for a dollar fifty or two dollars. How does that work when, when Coke's got wa that amount of water and sugar and flavouring and this and that and manufacturing? Like, I don't understand how that works. Like, when I went to the States last, I went into um, one of the airports, they have a 500ml bottle of Coke standing next to a 500ml bottle of water. The 500ml bottle of Coke was 80 US cents. The 500ml bottle of water cost me $5.50 US. Could you work that out? I can't work that out. That's crazy. <laughs> and, and the fact that I have to buy the flippin' water in the first place is crazy. <laughs> like. <laughs> so, yes, I am. And what I'm getting at with it is that all we need to do is act harmoniously with love and all of these things will change. That's what will happen. All of those things will change. And if I love myself, uh, acting in harmony, harmony with love of myself, many of these things will change. But you know what the problem is, is we don't have the faith that it's going to. And we somehow think there is no relationship between my personal actions and my unhealed soul condition and what's happening on the earth. And that's totally incorrect. There is a complete interaction a perfect interaction between what's happening on the planet and my own condition. <coughs> Everything is linked. And if I have some faith that I change my soul condition and these other factors will change, the craziness of buying water will change. The craziness of how we, we, we're willing to, to, to manufacture something that costs us 80 cents when and $5.50 for something that's good for us. Why does the thing good for us cost more than the thing that's bad for us? There's an emotional condition in me that, that creates that. Can you see that? Like, and if I have the faith that if I change the emotional condition, things will change, then things will change. That's how everything on the planet's ever changed. It's OK. Um, if, if we're thinking that we're going to change our emotional condition, our soul condition, do we have to have a vision of what we want it to be? Or is it just enough to, to um, hope that it's going to change by uh, you know, f feeling past emotions and things like that? An inspired vision is much more powerful than hope. Because ho hope could be something that's totally like based on an emotional injury. An inspired vision is totally different. The vision is very helpful. It activates your desire. If you, if you don't know where you're headed for, th there's not a lot of desire in that, is there? It's just like you said, it's just a hope that if I deal with this, things will get better. But if you can generate the vision and the desire, it's much more powerful. Mm. Can you imagine for a moment, if, if, as an illustration, you imagine that you've not got any fear anymore. If you just closed your eyes, so if, if, let's just try this as an audience, just close your eyes and imagine yourself as a completely fearless being, that you're not afraid to tell the truth to any single person in your entire life 
that you're not afraid to do anything. Like, so, so bungee jumping or whatever, that doesn't scare you anymore. And, and you know, f jumping out of a plane with a parachute, that doesn't frighten you anymore. Going swimming in the sea doesn't frighten you anymore. Talking to an angry person doesn't frighten you anymore. Right? Feeling angry spirits around you doesn't frighten you anymore. You see somebody being thrown by a spirit right, from one end of the room to the other and that doesn't scare you anymore. Right? You see these really grotesque spirits that you can picture in your mind but you can't see at the moment but you actually see them now with your eyes but they don't frighten you anymore either. And you're not afraid of anything that would happen to your children. You're not afraid of them getting run over by a truck or a car or falling off of a building or, or getting stung by a, an animal or getting bitten by an animal that caused them to have a lot of pain. You're not afraid of that anymore. And imagine for a moment you're not even afraid of pain anymore. So you don't even... It has no effect on you anymore. You, it has no response in you anymore. Can you imagine just being in that place? It sound, it's just an amazing place to be. Just imagine yourself being there. Now imagine if you could do that every single day, you could imagine yourself just for five minutes being in this place without fear. So five minutes a day, that's all you do. You just imagine it. Right? So what you're doing right now, if you're imagining it, is you're actually praying about it. And you're actually starting to conceive by just allowing the imagination to picture this place. You're starting to conceive what it would be like to be in this place without fear. And that faith that it can happen can now drive you for the rest of the day. You can remember what you imagined. So your imagination is a very powerful tool that you have to picture things that are, are idyllic that you want for yourself or for your environment or for the planet. And that imagination in itself is creative. And you can sit down and draw some pictures about it, what it would be like, how you would feel inside. And you could sit down and draw some pictures about what life would be like living with other people like this. Where not a single person gets angry with you anymore because they're no longer afraid. So if you can imagine yourself picturing that every single day, let's say you did that for five minutes in a day, how do you think you'd feel? Do you think you'd feel motivated to deal with your emotions that cause you to not be there? If you can keep, keep that picture in your mind? Of course you would be motivated, wouldn't you? And so as you allow that imagination to enter you, what happens, and, and see the pictures, the actual feelings inside of you grow. All through my life, the way I've discovered truth was that I first imagined what it would be like. And then what I did was I'd pray about it so, so much to see whether it's possible. So I imagine something, imagine what you know, I could conceive. So for example, with the soul union thing, right, in terms of the two halves of the soul becoming one, what happened originally was that it began in my imagination. Does that make sense? And I started imagining it, started imagining what it'd be like, and then I'd be talking about it with Mary in the spirit world, and we started both imagining what it'd be like to merge into this one soul. And I just feel, yes, there's a possibility here, there's something about this. And we start seeing the patterns in the universe, you know, the, the way everything is made seems to come in these two halves, you know. And, and looking at these patterns and then trying to apply it to our relationship and starting to see how it all comes together. And then in the spirit world, working on that relationship in such a manner that eventually the union process occurs where you become one, right? Now that began in my imagination. And it turned out to be a reality. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
So don't be afraid to imagine and picture in your mind possibilities. Yeah. What do you want to say? Um. AJ, a um, couple of things. One was that I was talking to Alan the other day as well about this. I, I can't perceive for too long and I haven't the fact that we will be existing in the manner that we have regarding money and the way we uh, operate financially. I, I have, I don't know whether it's faith, but there's some deep knowing that uh, we're very at the very end of a way of being mm -hmm. and that, that we will be operating mm -hmm. without money. Yep. And as what you were saying. Yep. You know? so, so now allow yourself to picture that and then act upon this faith you have of start living in that yourself. Yeah. So, so m many of us, like, this is what caused me to say, all right, I'm just going to do everything by donation. So what I'm going to do is trust that sooner or later I'll receive, if we can just turn off those mics at the moment. Um, uh, what I'm going to do s is trust that, that if I don't receive enough money to live, that actually that's something to do with my emotions that I need to deal with inside of myself. So, so I need to live in that manner. So rather than now focusing my life on getting enough money so that I can do the things on the weekend that I enjoy, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flip my life ho all over and I'm going to actually decide to do what I enjoy 100% of the time and then when I don't get the funds to get enough funds together for us to live on, I look at my emotional reasons within me of why it wasn't created, why I haven't created it inside of myself. And once I deal with those emotions, eventually those things come along and eventually you get to the point where now, like, I don't, I don't consider how money is spent at all, as Mary will attest to. And Mary still occasionally does. But I still, I have no consideration whatsoever about money itself. And I have no fear of how it's going to be used or whether I'm going to have enough or not or any of those things. And I don't live my life in that manner anymore where I'm worried about money from a day to day, whether I can pay a bill or not pay a bill. I don't have any worries about what I should buy or not buy. If I haven't got the money to buy it, I just don't buy it and I look at my own law of attraction. If I really wanted it, why isn't it coming to me right now? And what out of harmony with love is not coming to me right now. So I need to look at that as well. But deal with the emotions of it. And this is what we need to do. Like we all have the picture. Many of you have this picture of a life without money, right? Many of you have had this inspiration where you, you, know, you, you can see pictures given to you from spirits about life without money. But we don't translate it into action because we don't have faith. You see, what faith would motivate us to do is, all right, okay, Sooner or later, there's going to be no money on this planet, whether it happens because of economic breakdown or whether it happens because of earth changes or whatever is the reason. We know sooner or later, it has to go because it's not loving. Right? So, so sooner or later, there's going to be no money on this planet. So what do I do about that myself? Well, let's start acting like there's no money on this planet. Right? In the manner of let's first deal with every emotion that I have about money inside of myself. Now, if I'm positive, passionately desiring positive change and I have this knowing in my mind and that comes from a bit of a feeling in my heart that there is not going to be any money in the future, then why aren't I right now acting in harmony with that in my life? The only reason why I might not be is because of fear that I need to address. So let's go ahead as a group and deal with that fear. Let's deal with that fear. So let's look at, all right, I'm working in a job. Do I really like it? Is, am I passionate about it? If I'm not passionate about it, I leave it tomorrow. What? What? Well, I've got bills and I've got mortgage and I've got this. Yet, what you're going to do is you're going to become God-reliant and you're going to trust that actually you doing something that's harmonious with your desire tomorrow is actually going to fix all of these issues and you'll be able to have a place to live and everything will be cared for and all those things. You're going to start putting this truth that you're receiving into action, in other words. And faith is what does that. Faith is the only quality, in fact, if you think about it, that does that. Because if I don't have faith that the change is possible, then I won't act. And if I don't act, then it's going to stay the same anyway. Right? 
So yes, always act in harmony with your faith. Faith is a, a, not a passive quality. It's not something that you can just say, oh yeah, I've got faith, you know, I've got faith God exists, well okay. You say you've got faith God exists, but how much are you reliant on God? Show me your faith in action. There's a whole passage in the Bible that uh, was written based around my statements of faith in the first century and written in, in uh, the book of James about faith. And it's worth reading because it, it's all about how faith motivates action. Right? A person who has faith isn't easily manipulated from your faith. So in other words, if you have faith that there is not going to be any money in the future, for example, and you decide right now, I'm going to start living my life where I am actually going to trigger every money issue that I actually have within myself. Now, your friends are going to come up to you and say, what, what are you doing? You gave away your job? That was a good job. Right? Now, what they're doing is they're infiltrating you with their fear. Now, that's going to trigger some of your own fear about the issue. Does that make sense? So what happens then? Is I then go into a state of fear and when I'm in a state of fear what, I'm also in this other place which is a lack of faith place which is a place of doubt. So now what I do is I start doubting that what I believe is possible is possible for me. All right, so I doubt, oh, oh yeah, maybe they're right, maybe they're right. Maybe I, oh, I better go back and get that job from the boss, you know, again, and, and say, I'm sorry, I was just going, went through a momentary phase of craziness, you know, and I just <laughs> want that job back. And, and what we do then is we, because of the lack of faith within ourselves, we allow the doubts and the fears from our environment to infiltrate us emotionally, and then we act upon them. So many of us do that on a moment-by-moment moment basis. So let's challenge that. So we challenge that by acting in harmony with our faith. So we, many of us coming along because we believe, yes, our soul is very powerful. And yet we say, oh, I've got to go to work 40 hours a week. If your soul's so powerful, why do you have to work 40 hours a week? Why, why can't you just work two hours a week? Or maybe, maybe not work any hours a week that you feel is work, right? but it's just your passion. So in other words, like, let's say oh, my passion was art. So all I did, all of my time that I had that I wanted to do it, all I did was my art. If it was music, then all I do is my music and just see where my passion takes me. And if it doesn't bring what I need to sustain myself, I look at my law of attraction and have faith that actually all I need to do is a deal with my law of attraction and something will change and all of a sudden I'll have the funds available to me if I follow my passion. Can you talk about uh, Inna in New Zealand? Who, um, oh yeah, the letter we got from Inna. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can talk about it. Yeah, so Inna's a lady in New Zealand who's been on the divine love path largely on her own because there hasn't been very many other people in New Zealand uh, who have been listening to the DVDs or anything. And She is a massage therapist and um, what she does, she lives in like a little holiday town and she gives massages to people. And she, ha she has a standard rate that she charges. And we went to visit her on our trip to New Zealand and um, we didn't talk to her about that at all, but we were just talking about different emotions and money and things like that. And the day after we left, unbeknownst to us, she decided to make all of her services by donation. And that, that triggered a huge fear for her. She felt like this is her only source of income. She doesn't have any family in New Zealand. She's just renting a place and she's got a little car. And, um, but she decided that was the most... That was in harmony with love. And um, I guess she had faith that something positive would come from that. And we received a letter from her um, just this week saying that mm. actually what has happened is that sometimes... Um, she doesn't receive as much money and sometimes she actually refuses money from people if she feels or refuses to give the massage if she feels there's something sexual going on or there's some other needy based thing happening for the person and she said but the really the much more beautiful thing for her which is what she was actually talking to us about which was living in her passion she felt she wasn't doing that 
the beautiful thing that's happened is she started to attract clients that want to talk about their emotions because she was finding the opposite beforehand um, and that she's able to talk about um, what she's really passionate about, truth and emotions and things like that, just in her day-to-day -day life and she has enough to live on. So for her, the lesson was really about... You don't need to look at me so much. <laughs> I just looked at you. Then. I know. Yeah. Um, the lesson was really about. <laughs> I put her off there. The lesson was really about um, taking a focus off money, and she actually got more quality of life. Mm. And she was just expressing her joy about what what she was treating before as a job. She had a bit of her passion in but it felt like a job because of the money transactions that were going on. Now that she stopped the money transactions going on, when a person, when a man comes in who's sexually projecting her or wants a massage, she just refuses to massage him and sends him on his way, right? And then and when somebody else comes in who wants a massage and they have a pure desire to deal with emotion, she says, no worries, and off she goes and gives them a two-hour massage, you know, like, and does it in her passion. And ironically, she's having just as much funds um, not from specific individuals, but overall, just as much fun as she's ever had, but, but she's also now enjoying the entire process. Can you see she's also brought her heart, life into harmony with her passion, into harmony with divine love, and also feeling, as a result, so much more joy. Because, and what she needed was faith. She needed faith that if she did the thing in harmonious with divine truth and love, that in the end everything would be okay if she dealt with her emotions about it otherwise. That's what she needed. Yeah. And Lindley, you've had your hand up for some time, so let's go. Hi, AJ. Hi, Mary. Uh, what's the relationship of trust to faith? And is it the same or is faith something that's in the future and trust is in the present or...? Can you explain the difference between that? You've please? explained it exactly. Yeah, faith, trust is in the present and faith is in the future. Um, so, so the truth is that with regard, both qualities are very important qualities. There is very, very little trust on the uh, problem. Yeah. Um, so in answer to your question, yeah, faith is something about the future. So where we have a feeling about something being possible in the future as long as we act in harmony with love and truth right now, that will occur. Trust is something very different. And trust is, uh, based, is an emotion too, uh, just like faith is uh, an emotion. But trust is very much about the present. Um, and perhaps if we can illustrate it, um, many of us have a feeling of mistrust within us about all sorts of matters, right? So when you hear somebody on the telly, like last night... Uh, we heard that there was a, uh, a plane that, was, uh, that came down through pilot error um, uh, in the Soviet Union and it happened to have the Polish president on board. And there were 90 people died yesterday through this accident. And my immediate feeling was that that wasn't true. Right? that it wasn't just an accident caused by pilot error. That was my immediate feeling. Now, that's a feeling. Now, I can either trust that feeling or I can dismiss that feeling and mistrust that feeling. Now, if I trust that feeling, um, I will often do things or say things based on my trust of the feeling. If I mistrust the feeling, often I am silent, so I won't say anything about it. Now, many of you in our interactions is, is like this with emotions, right? Many of you, the reason I feel an emotion from you enter me and I trust that I can feel that emotion coming from you. Does that make sense? Now, that only occurs after lots and lots and lots of your own emotional release. So when I began this process, I didn't trust any of my own emotions. Right? But after a while, what happened is I learnt to release an emotion and then I realised that once I released that emotion... I can feel that emotion in any other person. Does that make sense? Once I've released it in myself and no longer got a judgment of it inside of myself, I can now feel that emotion inside the other person who I'm relating to. And then I, through a series of events, come to trust that that's the truth. 
Can you see that trust is something that is built by past experience? Can you see what I'm saying with that? So in other words, I come to trust something because of a past experience with it. By the way, mistrust is the same. I come to mistrust it because of past experiences. And often we bring the past experiences into the present when it comes to trust. Now, trust is something is, that is built over time through past experiences. Faith, you can begin with with no past experience at all. And that's a very big difference between the two qualities. Faith is something about the future and I can begin at this point by trusting, like I can have a trust inside of myself that actually God is a totally punishing God. So in other words, I believe that with all my heart, that God's a punishing God. But someone comes along and tells me that actually God's not a punishing God, God's a loving God. So I can have this feeling of mistrust within myself about God right at this moment, but at the same time have faith that God's not like that. Does that make sense? Because one is about the future, about me coming to see some things in the future. The other is about what's happening for me right now from my past. So as I trust, I am going to very much base, my trust is going to be based on past events. But my faith doesn't have to be based on past events. I can establish faith about things in the future just by imagining like we just did earlier, just imagining that you're without fear. What does that do inside of myself? Do, do any of us really believe we're going to get to that place? Now, some of us feel like, yeah, I, w I want to get to that place. We have a hope we're going to get to that place. We have faith that we'll get to that place if we deal with a lot of emotions that prevent it. But we don't know we're going to be at that place until we're at that place. So there's a time when faith transfers into knowing or knowledge. And when I say knowledge, I'm not talking about intellectual knowledge. I'm talking about the fact that I can do it now. So in other words, many of you trust that you can levitate your body. Like when I say trust, probably <laughs> faith. Many of you have faith that you can levitate your body. Right? None of you have done it yet, I gather. Because I'd like to see you do it if, if you can, because I'd like to learn how to do it myself. Right? So, so, so none of you at the moment can actually le no, levitate your body actually but you have a faith perhaps that you might be able to in the future. But when you actually physically do it, do you need faith in it anymore? No. Does that make sense? Faith then is transferred into actual reality. So I now have done it. So we only need faith for the period of when we haven't done it and we're leading to a point where we do complete it. So, for example, the Wright brothers, when they produced the aircraft that flew, the the one that is recorded in history is the first one flying, right? What happened is they had to have faith that they could actually do it. They trusted a lot of their past engineering experience and a lot of aerodynamic type work that they had done and all those other things. They trusted all their past stuff and that caused them to have a faith that they could produce a machine based on all of this past stuff that would give them the ability to fly in the future. And then the moment they first flew, what do you think they felt besides euphoria? <laughs> they felt now they knew they had done it. Now, they not, now no longer faith was needed. Now there was, I know now. No, now there's knowledge. So the three qualities, faith and, sorry, the two qualities of faith and trust are very important in your progression. But of the two, I feel faith is the greatest motivator. Yeah. If we come down here. Oh, what's the time? It's after three o'clock. Let's have a break. Um, can we have a break for about uh, 45 minutes or so? And then we'll come back after the break. How's that? <laughs>